we'll get started here in a couple minutes, but it, it is so good to have all of you here this evening. I do see some folks here from the UNT community, University of North Texas. And uh, so, so good to have you here. <laughs> uh, it, see Professor Asia Martinez from English, Professor Clark Parmelo, Professor Ol uh, Olga is here as well, hello. And uh, many people as well from the Northern Texas Lutheran community. see. All right, well, it seems like we, oh, more people are going to join. I will be letting people in as they come. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. My name is Robert Smith. I am the director of Briarwood Leadership Center, the organization hosting this conversation this evening. Briarwood is a ministry of the Northern Texas, Northern Louisiana Synod of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, led by Bishop Eric Gronberg. I'm a pastor in the ELCA as well as director of Briarwood Leadership Center. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, uh, the uh, tribe that is just across the Red River uh, from where we are in Denton, Texas now. Um, I'm also an academic historian working at the intersection of religion and politics. And for some time, I worked for the churchwide offices of our denomination directing our church's work in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma City, uh, which meant that I was raised in a fundamentalist evangelical church that was heavily invested in the Cold War threat of Russian nuclear annihilation. I mean, every other week, that, that's, that's what we heard uh, in, in our church. And so that was my vision of Russia <laughs> for the most part growing up. And I... However, in 1990, my family moved to Frankfurt, Germany, uh, where my father had a position uh, with the U.S. government, and I got to know a whole other side of the world, <laughs> being, being in that European environment just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, traveling to Berlin a couple of times from Frankfurt uh, during that time. And so the Cold War then went on hiatus. I wouldn't say that the Cold War ended. Uh, but went on hiatus, at least in American consciousness. Um, and then the, all of those experiences I carried with me when I traveled on my ELCA-related travels it, to Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland while I worked for the ELCA. And that included visits to Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, which were so important for me to get a different sense of Russian culture. That was, that was in 2007. And... Uh, uh, Voyan and I were, were discussing what, what Moscow specifically was like in 2007, <laughs> and that it has changed so much since then. Well, this evening, I'm so pleased to be in conversation with Professor Voyan Maestrovich, uh, who's an historian of the Soviet Red Army, working as an assistant professor of history at the University of North Texas. Uh, professor Maestrovich has special knowledge of the Red Army in World War II, and especially the, the, the Soviet Red Army's experiences of the Holocaust. It was the Soviets who liberated Auschwitz and other camps uh, in, in that time frame. And so a very important uh, part of, of historical perspective. Uh, Prof Professor Maestrovich was in Ukraine two weeks ago until his archival research was interrupted by US bureaucratic concerns for his safety. Um, I've been in, in those international situations too, where folks in the U.S. are far more concerned about your context than you yourself might be. <laughs> um, but I've invited him for this conversation primarily because of the knowledge base, but also for the simple fact that most U.S. media coverage of this present crisis has been highlighting American and British perspectives. Here in the United States, we are not hearing from people uh, sharing Ukrainian and Russian perspectives. Uh, Professor Maestrovich himself is Serbian, but also Canadian, and now uh, American in some ways, <laughs> a, a citizen of the world, um, and, and is bringing those perspectives from Ukraine and Russia this evening in the conversation. 
Here in Northern Texas, uh, the, the sphere of concern primarily for our communities in the Northern Texas, Northern Louisiana Synod, uh, our lives could be directly affected by any uh, outbreak of conflict uh, around Ukraine, in Ukraine. Uh, we have many soldiers who have been deployed already from Fort Hood, which is the largest U.S. military installation in the world, uh, situated next to Colleen, Texas, in the southern part of what we would call northern Texas. And we, we of course, have so many different military bases scattered around this area. But I would think, too, that Americans who benefit from global empire, the global empire that the United States has been cultivating since its founding, and especially since uh, the end of the Second World War, uh, we should be very aware of how our country is acting in the world and asking difficult questions of our, own, of our leaders as they are, are contributing toward building conflict uh, with other powers in the world. So my perspective is that we should be suspicious of our own leaders' activities and perspectives, and that we should listen carefully uh, to, to others who will be affected by the conflict and others who may participate in the conflict. Um, so my hope for this evening is that we can better comprehend, better understand Russian and Ukrainian perspectives and the motivations that have led to this current stage of concern and the question of what might happen next. So we're going to be a bit speculative in our conversation, but all of this is about being responsible citizens of the world, especially those of us who are citizens of the United States who benefit from global empire. Uh, so we can better understand how our country is acting in the world and what our responsibilities might be in response to that. And with that, I, I invite Professor Vojin Masarovic uh, to this conversation. He will present uh, for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then uh, we'll do some one-on-one -on -one conversation, clarify, points of clarification, and then open it up to broader question and answers so that your questions and contributions can be part of this uh, conversation as well. Thanks again to each and every one of you for being part of this. And uh, Voyan, please take it away. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And thanks for the very nice introduction. I'm not a citizen of the United States, but I did recently become a permanent resident, which is, I guess, a step <laughs> along the way. Uh, so uh, I am, as you said, I'm a historian and I'll uh, I'm not a journalist, I'm not an expert on international relations. So what I will do today is uh, give my perspective as a historian on what's happening in Ukraine and what are uh, rather, perhaps more accurately, what are Russia's intentions with regards to Ukraine. Uh, I'll, the talk is divided into three parts. Uh, the first, I'll talk about. Uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, old sort of history uh, here in Rus, and uh, the second part will be about uh, Ukraine and Soviet Union and Russia and Soviet Union. Very brief overviews, and then the third part, which is most of my talk before we get into the conversation, uh, is. Uh, will be about what happens after 1992, 1991, when the Soviet Union breaks up. So I'll begin with a nice uh, slideshow, which I have to share first. Hold on. I'm getting so much better at operating uh, Zoom than in the beginning of the pandemic. OK. Uh, I'm sharing the screen, hopefully successfully. If I'm not, let me know. You can interrupt me. So uh, Kiev and Rus to Soviet Union. So this is map of Europe today with all of uh, countries there. And you can see Ukraine and Russia in Eastern Europe. Uh, slide two zooms in on Eastern Europe or Ukraine specifically. And the map, I want to highlight a couple of key places on this map that I'll be going back to in the talk, especially at the end. Uh, in the very south of Ukraine, you have this peninsula, that's Crimea. It's not 
name of a map, but uh, that's the territory that was annexed by Russia in 2014. In the east of Ukraine, you have city called Donetsk, and that's the center of the two rebel regions of Ukraine where there is active fighting taking place today. And then in the center, obviously, you have Kiev. Uh, so the history of Russia, Ukraine, and uh, Belarus, the three countries, uh, can be traced to Kiev and Rus, uh, which was founded in 19th century AD by then still pagan East Slavic tribes, potentially led by Vikings. Uh, they converted to Christianity in 10th, 10th century, adopting uh, Orthodox Christianity from the Byzantine Empire. It made sense for Kievan Rus to adopt Orthodoxy from Constantinople because it was its main trading partner, just farther south across the Black Sea. Uh, and so it made political and economic sense. Uh, the significance of this uh, conversion is that Orthodoxy set apart Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus from its neighbors to the west, who tended well, who, who eventually became Catholic, and then some became Protestant in the Baltic states. Uh, Kiev and Rus included much more uh, than the city of Kiev. So this is the map of Kiev and Rus from the 11th century. Uh, and uh, Kiev and Rus was really a collection of principalities uh, that shared the lang language and uh, Orthodox religion, and they traded with each other and they recognized Kiev as its capital city. It's notable that at the time, uh, Moscow was not even on the map. Uh, you can see the town of Suzdal in the very east, on the very edge of what was considered part of Kiev and Rus. That's close to where Moscow is today. Um, and that's something that the Ukrainians after the conflict began, I like to point out is that when Kiev and Rus emerged, Moscow didn't really register as a proper city. Uh, and within this loose union of city states, principalities, Kiev was the economic, trading, political, and religious capital of East Slavs. Slide four is a, a Kiev Kiev monastery uh, from 11th century. It still stands today in Kiev. Obviously, additions were added to the monastery, but the oldest parts of the monastery are from 11th century. Um, and the Kievan Rus was never a centralized state, and uh, it was invaded by the Mongols in 13th century. The Kiev was completely destroyed and did not recover as a major uh, city for uh, centuries. But other parts of Kiev and Rus prospered under Tatar, under Mongol domination, but not direct rule. And Moscow is one of those principalities that managed to prosper. Uh, Poland, Poland, Hungary, and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania seized other territories of the Kievan Rus. And so the emergence of the principality of Muscovy is the origins of modern Russian history, really. It was led by a branch of Rurik dynasty that ruled Kievan Rus, uh, and it gradually grew. And it took over smaller principalities, paying tribute to Mongols and their successors. Uh, and then finally, they merged to rival neighboring Lithuania and Crimean Kanats. Kind of. uh, this is, uh, this, on this slide, you can see the growth of Moscow, rather sort of dramatic growth. It began as a city state and it expanded to become the dominant power in European part of the Euro-Asian mass. Uh, in 14th century, Kiev Metropolitan, the head of the Orthodox East Slavic world, moved from Kiev to Vladimir in Russia, not far from Moscow, and then they settled in Moscow. And uh, not long after, even the fourth declared Muscovy to be the Tsardom of Russia, staking a claim that Moscow was the successor of Kiev in Rus. Uh, and this is where all of the ideas, especially prevalent in Russia today, that the Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Uh, it comes from this idea that uh, they're all successors to Kiev and Rus, and that the Metropolitan eventually moved from Kiev to Moscow. 
Uh, speaking specifically about territories of today's Ukraine, they became after Mongols, uh, they became part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And Bogdan Helnitsky, a nobleman from Zaporozhye area in eastern Ukraine, led a rebellion of Cossacks, a sort of a military caste of nobles joined by Orthodox peasants against the Poles in the 17th century. They captured Kiev from Poles and launched terrible pogroms against the Jews, the Catholic clergy, and Polish nobility. In the strike between the Cossacks and Poles, Kulnitsky swore allegiance to the Russian Tsar in Moscow in order to receive his protection. And in exchange, the Cossack state led was supposed to have autonomy within the Russian a bigger uh, empire, Tsardom. Kulnitsky uh, is a contentious figure today. I have a monument of him in Kiev. Uh, because on the one hand, he's seen as somebody who led the uprising against the Poles for liberation of Ukraine, but on the other hand, he swore allegiance and tied Ukraine or what would eventually become Ukraine to Russia. Uh, nonetheless, his monument still stands in the center of Kiev. Uh, in the Russian Empire, what is today Ukraine was known as Little Russia, Central Ukraine, and New Russia and uh, New Russia was in South and East. They were viewed as part of Russia that was under Catholic control, but which Russia slash Muscovy liberated. Uh, the class identity was much more important in Imperial Russia than national identity, although Ukrainian nationalism in a modern sense began developing in the 19th century. It was mostly intellectuals and students who were attracted to nationalist ideology, and the Ukrainian national movement grew, especially during the 1905 revolution. Finally, when the Tsarist Empire collapsed, there was an explosion of nationalism and class activism all over Imperial Russia. And in Ukraine, there is a series of armies vying for control. Whites were those who supported the Tsar, uh, Ukrainian nationalists, uh, communists, and obviously communists won. Moving on <laughs> to Soviet Ukraine. Uh, moving to a thousand years of history in five minutes. Uh, but it is what it is. Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Soviet state, a good Marxist and Bolshevik, believed that nationalism is an inevitable stage of development of every uh, community. He concluded that the Bolsheviks should get ahead of the game. Uh, the thinking was if we, that is the Bolsheviks, promote minority cultures, languages, and national identity, uh, then all of these nationalities of the Soviet Union minorities would develop national identity in tandem with Marxism. And thus, all the nationalities would be loyal to Moscow. In the early years of Soviet Union, until the 1930s, Moscow promoted this cultural policy. One historian called this, called Soviet Union affirmative action empire for its promotion of minority cultures and languages. Uh, a popular slogan from this period was socialist in content, national in form. It meant that all of propaganda, all of education, everything had to have communist uh, ideology, but uh, uh, it could be presented in national languages of Soviet Union. Ukrainian schools were opened, uh, introduced Ukrainian languages, introduced to higher learning and culture. Ukrainian government communicated in Ukrainian, and uh, there was a revival of Ukrainian language all over Soviet Union. Not only in Ukraine, but in parts of Russia, the ethnic Ukrainians lived as well. This relatively liberal period of Soviet rule uh, coincided with the new economic policy when Bolshe Bolsheviks basically left the villages alone and allowed peasants to sell grain to cities at their own terms. Uh, these policies came to an end with Stalin's revolution from above in the 1930s, aimed at industrializing and modernizing the Soviet Union in anticipation of the coming war in Europe. Uh, the Soviet leaders, really Stalin, uh, by this point, he decided to collectivize farming. And what that meant was to seize all of the land from peasants and manage it by the state. Uh, the idea was that peasants, some 80% of the population, would finance the industrialization drive. The state would be able to take more grain, 
from peasants, sell it to the West, and they would use the hard currency to buy tools necessary to finance industrialization. Parallel with the collectivization process was the depolitization or getting rid of Kulak, supposedly rich peasants. Uh, in reality, it was simply a policy to get rid of potential opponents of the Soviet regime in the countryside. Uh, the war against the countryside led to deaths of an estimated 5 million peasants in the Soviet Union in early 1930s. And uh, that's a relatively conservative estimate. Uh, oh, okay, so I missed Lenin. It doesn't matter. Uh, nobody misses Lenin. Uh, so this is a monument uh, to Hodomor in Kiev. Uh, Hodomor is how Ukrainian Ukrainians commemorate the famine that happened in Ukraine in 1930s. Uh, anywhere between three to four million uh, peasants died in Ukraine in early 30s. So this is Hodomor. Uh, usually now the term famine genocide is used to describe what happened uh, to Ukrainian peasants. Although of course, peasants all over the Soviet Union died in large numbers, although not as much as in Ukraine. Uh, the argument is that the Stalinist regime deliberately starved the rebellious Ukrainians and that uh, uh, it committed genocide obliquely by not killing Ukrainians directly, executing them by starving them to death. Um, another argument would be that the regime variously targeted peasants and sought to extract grain from the most productive lands, which happened to be in Ukraine, but that there wasn't a specific plan to kill Ukrainian peasants because they were Ukrainians. So however you want to view this, uh, Stalin murdered millions of Ukrainians through famine. Uh, and this is something that emerges as an important part of Ukrainian identity in the 1990s and an important part of Ukrainian anti-Russian mobilization. Uh, in the 1930s, Stalin also reverses some of Leninist nationality policies. Russians uh, were restored to status of the so-called big brother of the Soviet family of nations. Uh, Russian culture was promoted at the center of Soviet Union as the glue that held the entire country together. Russian language became more dominant in Ukraine and across the Soviet Union. There was a return to family values uh, and all sorts of other things happened that uh, marked this shift to the right by Stalin, such as criminalization of abortion, uh, criminalization, recriminalization of uh, abortion, and some other family oriented policies as well. Uh, and so that's Stalin getting ready for coming war in Europe by making a conservative turn. Uh, and Stalin makes a pact with Hitler in 1939, the non aggression pact, and uh, Soviet Union receives large parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, on this slide, you can see Soviet Union in 1938, and then in 1939, they seize uh, half of Poland, in, which includes large parts of Ukraine and Belarus today, and the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Moldavia from Romania in the Southwest. One of the ironies is that Stalin is when Soviet propaganda sold Stalin as somebody who united Ukrainian gatherer of Ukrainian lands, because he united uh, ethnic U Ukrainian territories from uh, that were in Poland with Soviet Ukraine. Ukrainians suffered immensely during the war. The millions died in the Red Army and then under the Nazi occupation, which sought to colonize Ukraine. And Ukraine was along with Belarus, probably the country in Europe that suffered the highest percentage of casualties. Uh, in Soviet Ukrainian territories, so those not annexed after 1938, but that were part of Soviet Union since 1920s, uh, scholars who have studied the identity of Ukrainians have argued that although they may have hated the Soviet regime, they view themselves as Ukrainians, but they viewed Ukrainians as a branch of the Russian nation. So this was, uh, identities in Ukraine tended to reflect the official Soviet narrative. 
and that eventually the Nazi occupation made the Soviet regime not look so bad uh, in comparison. After the war, there was a major insurgence by Ukrainian nationalists in Western Ukraine uh, that was put down successfully only in early 1950s. So it took Stalin and Soviet Union years uh, to restore order in these newly annexed Polish territories after they expelled the Germans. Uh, this insurgency led by people who collaborated with the Nazis in early stages of the war also uh, remains a factor of division in Ukraine today, both between uh, Ukrainians with different political views and how they view history, but also between Ukraine and Russia. And then uh, nationalism grows in the 1980s, and Ukraine, like elsewhere in Eastern Europe, uh, there's a collapse of communism, and Ukraine gets its independence. So I'm moving now into post-Soviet period, which is really what I'll talk about for most of today's presentation. Uh, slide 10. So this is the map of independent Ukraine. Uh, the liberal nationalist narrative, which is often united in Ukraine, uh, claims that Ukraine's independence was Unavoidable, unavoidable, a result of repressed Ukrainians' long struggle for freedom. So this, it is pointed out that in a referendum that had 84% turnout, 92% of Ukrainians voted for independence on December 1st, 1991. It is also pointed out that the majority of every region, even the most pro-Russian Crimea and Donbass, I mean, pro-Russian after 2014, uh, that even majority there voted for independence. All of this is true. However, the, this narrative overlooks an important fact. Only months earlier, in March 1991, the ma majority of Soviet Union and over 80% of Ukrainians on the territory of Ukraine voted in a referendum to preserve a type of Soviet Union. Um, so obviously there's lots going on. Uh, the transition away from communism was hard everywhere in the former Soviet Union, but it was arguably the worst in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine was a relatively privileged republic in the Soviet Union, especially in the post-war period. It was one of the centers of industry and technology. One scholar recently argued that if Soviet Union was an empire, then Ukraine's relationship to the imperial center, Moscow, was like Scotland to England. There is Ukraine and Belarus as well, were privileged republics in the Soviet Union. However, the Soviet economy was very well integrated and Ukraine lost a large market for its industrial goods, a market that it could not replace with the West. The West simply had no interest in buying the Soviet type industrial products. Yet Ukraine, unlike Russia, did not have natural resources to prop up its economy. Uh, and so if you look at slide one, uh, it's a Ukraine's uniquely bad economy in the former Soviet space. Uh, if you can see that at Soviet Union's collapse, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, and even Romania and Poland, which would go on to enter the European Union, had similar GDP per capita. But uh, 19 years later, uh, Russia was doing much better than at the time of Soviet collapse, whereas Ukraine was, had the same level of income as they did, as they did 20 years earlier. Uh, another lesson of this <laughs> graph is that those countries with joined the European Union, such as Romania and Poland, obviously did uh, much better. Uh, Another feature of Ukraine is its linguistical diversity. Uh, on the one hand, Ukrainian is the only official language in the Ukraine. Uh, and the Russian language has been deliberately squeezed out of public life as part of the nation building project. It's greatly limited on radios, TVs, uh, and in the media. Uh, and it's been all but removed from education. Uh, there is no popular support for most of these restrictions, but this is the consensus of the uh, ruling circles in Ukraine, that Ukrainiz Ukrainization is necessary for nation building. Uh, but despite these 
uh, measures uh, Russians, Russian language is used at home by 43 to 46 percent of the population of the country. Although just under 30 percent claims Russian to be their native language. And Ukraine is probably the most bilingual place in Europe. Sometimes uh, there's a conversation taking place in two different languages at the same time. Uh, and these divides tend to be geographical, which is another thing that matters. Uh, let's, and let me see. So this is uh, the next slide. And so the Russian, this is the map of Russian language in Ukraine. Uh, you can see that only 5% of the West uses Ukrainian and the West are these territories which belong to Poland and which were not historically part of Imperial Russia. But that East and South tends to use Russian language overwhelmingly and even majority of uh, Central Ukraine does as well. Uh, Voting patterns in post-Soviet Ukraine mimic the language issues until the Euromaidan revolution of 2014, which shall get soon. Uh, in 2005, there was an orange revolution. The country was divided, uh, voted as according to the linguistic map, more or less. The establishment candidate, Viktor Yanukovych, was declared the winner, but the election was rigged on large scale Peaceful protests in Kiev led to new elections in which the opposition and more pro-European candidate won. In 2000, so this was 2005. In 2010, uh, the candidate that tried to steal the election but lost, Viktor Yanukovych, he made, made a stunning comeback. Uh, he became the candidate of the opposition and he actually uh, won the election as an opposition candidate. And so on this map, so I'll go back, this is the language map, Russian in the east and south, and this is uh, Yanukovych, one of those so same regions in east and south where uh, Russian language tends to be spoken more. Uh, parts of central Ukraine is also very Russophone, but they tended to vote for Timoshenko, who was a representative of the Orange Revolution. Uh, these these divisions would have continued unchanged had it not been for a fundamental uh, policy shift in Russia. So initially, when Putin, so I'm going to talk about Russia now, however, uh, when Putin comes to power in 2000, he sought to continue Yeltsin's general course of improving relations with the West. And so the height of this was cooperation with the Americans in Afghanistan. He offered uh, airspace and bases in Central Asia for the Americans to use in Afghanistan. And he even publicly spoke about Russia perhaps entering NATO and the European Union and creating new era of cooperation and partnership. But for Russia, this idea of partnership would always be about equality between Russia on the one hand and the West on the other hand. Uh, these initiatives did not get anywhere. Uh, the war in Iraq uh, fought unilaterally by United States and its allies without UN approval, uh, led the Russian establishment to lose illusions about creating this partnership with the West. And uh, at the same time, Russia more and more spoke openly against NATO expansion towards Russia's borders. So this is, uh, sorry, uh, so this is a map of NATO expansion from its original in uh, Western Europe towards Russian borders. Uh, in 2007, uh, Putin gave, I think, a historical speech at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, in the speech, he railed against unilateralism of the United States, the unipolar world, the US bombing of Yugoslavia, and the invasion of Iraq. He complained about the disrespect of Russia and other countries that were not part of this alliance system. But his invective was directed mostly at NATO. Uh, he said that NATO has put its frontline forces on our borders. Uh, although we do not react to these actions at all. And then he added, yet. NATO expansion, he stated, represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust 
and we have the right to ask against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurances of our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact? Uh, and here he's referring to the Russian claim that uh, American representatives promised them that NATO would not actually expand beyond its original, um, beyond the countries that originally belonged to NATO. Uh, the West has disputed that they ever made these assurances. Uh, in 2008, NATO offered a roadmap for Ukraine and Georgia, also former Soviet Republic, to enter NATO. Uh, this is Putin at the Munich conference giving his speech and being very angry as he frequently is when he talks about NATO. So in 2008, uh, NATO offers a roadmap for Ukraine and Georgia. And Georgia is also a former Soviet state. It's a roadmap to enter NATO. It wasn't an invitation, but a promise of future path to NATO. And so this was in line with the official position of the Ukrainian nationalist government, which won the election in 2005 by less than 1% of the vote. However, at the same time, less than 30% of Ukrainians wanted to enter NATO. And so repeated polls indicate that it's the level of support for NATO membership in Ukraine was 25 to 30 percent. And so for, from Russian perspective, or rather Russian leadership perspective, this was not so much about what Ukrainians wanted, but that NATO wanted to come to Russia's doorsteps. The Russian elites in general, and not just Putin, uh, they view NATO enlargement as a genuine threat. Uh, the concept of strategic depth is something that's very important to Russian military and security thinking. Russia was invaded repeatedly from the West, so this strategic depth is supposed to give them security. So there should be buffer states or allied states on its doorstep. Uh, NATO was already in the Baltic states on Russia's border, but Ukraine would bring NATO much closer to Moscow and the border between a new NATO member of Ukraine and Russia would be much bigger. A NATO membership would obviously also permanently remove Ukraine from Russia's border. Uh, the Western officials repeatedly tell Russians, uh, don't worry, Ukraine won't enter NATO anytime soon. But from Kremlin perspective, uh, they say, well, we heard this about, we heard this before about Poland and Czech Republic and about Bulgaria and Romania. And so, uh, in Moscow, there is a sense of urgency to settle the Ukraine issue. So, but I think that NATO is not the only reason that Putin is actually concerned about. Uh, the Soviet narrative is that Russia is the big brother to Ukraine and Belarus, and that they're smaller, younger brothers. And Putin's take on this, and he spoke about this repeatedly, he even wrote historical essays on it. And it's that Russia and Belarusia and Ukraine are one people uh, united by Orthodox religion. Uh, they chase their origins to Kiev and Rus, but that uh, they were separated by Leninist Bolshevik policies and other historical events. And his mission is to restore the unity of these three uh, people. Uh, this obviously represents a threat to Ukrainian uh, independence. And I also think that uh, the Russian leaders like to talk about NATO more because it's something that's understandable and uh, where they perhaps do have a point that there's no reason for NATO to be on Russia's border. But the real issue is not only NATO membership. It is NATO membership, but it's also about the relationship between Russia and Ukraine and that they want to have a dominant influence in Ukraine. If not, wanting Ukraine to be completely in their zone of control. Uh, so this emergence of Putin's, the more aggressive line against NATO expansion in Russia coincided with the intention of dictatorship in Russia and fanning of the flames of nationalism. So according to the Russian constitution, Putin was supposed to be president only twice. Uh, and he, so he served two mandates and then he said, well, now I'll become prime minister. So for one mandate, there was another president, Dmitry Medvedev. And then he came back saying, well, now I have a right to be president for two more times. 
because the constitution allows this, and then they just change the constitution so he can be twice more president. So basically he can be president forever. Uh, and he's been in power for 20 years, he's 69. Uh, he's 69, it's not, but I mean, he's healthy, has the best doctors in Russia. He exercises regularly. Uh, he can easily rule for another 20 or 25, well, 20 years. Uh, it's not easy for people in his position just to leave the presidency and hope for things to work out in retirement as they hang out with their grandkids. Uh, Russia was never really a democracy under Putin, but there was a lot more pluralism previously, and that pluralism is diminishing consistently, especially in the past few years. Uh, at this point, I would say that there is freedom of speech for most part. Uh, internet for most part is free and open and you can read absolutely anything you want on the internet, uh, including Western media and Russian, but that organizing opposition parties, protests, or any type of organized opposition is not possible in Russia. And as soon as there is an attempt by opposition to organize, they, uh, it doesn't work out. Uh, and so this is happening in Russia as Ukraine uh, is uh, Yanukovych, this supposedly pro-Russian candidate, wins the election in 2010. Uh, Russia finally has, they think they have their guy in office in Kiev. And so Yanukovych, again, who won democratically as an opposition candidate, uh, he rejects Ukraine entering NATO, arguing that a minority of Ukrainian support this anyway. But now Russians aren't only interested in not letting Ukraine join NATO, but they also don't want them to join EU or to begin the path towards EU accession. And so Russia proposes Ukraine join this Euro-Asian customs union. It's a customs union between several former Soviet countries and it presents this as an alternative to EU. Yanukovych plays a balancing role between Europe and Russia uh, this is Yanukovych, this is a cartoon of Yanukovych trying to do that, to sit uh, on two chairs. On, in this cartoon you can see that one chair says Russia, the other one Europe, uh, and it doesn't really get anywhere. Uh, and uh, Yanukovych indicates that he will sign the agreement with the EU, uh, but then in the last moment he postpones the decision, he says we'll make the decision after the next presidential election and he accepts a large loan from Russia to prop up the failing Ukrainian economy. So what's happening in Ukraine at this time? So most polls indicate that there is a slight plurality of Ukrainians prefer European Union over Customs Union. So 41% uh, to 35% prefers European Union to Customs Union. And, but the problem is that EU isn't offering membership to Ukraine. They're not even offering a clear path to membership. They're offering a bunch of trade agreements, well, which will not lead to membership eventually. Uh, and there's regional and generational breakdowns over these preferences for EU and customs union. Uh, and so Euromaidan protests begin in late 2013. So Euromaidan protests, it's <clears throat> young Ukrainian students <laughs> they protest in central Kiev, wanting uh, to enter, they want Yanukovych to sign this agreement with the EU. But there's also general dissatisfaction with Yanukovych, his very corrupt government, and it's even corrupt by Ukraine standards, which is acknowledged as the, one of the most corrupt countries in Europe. Uh, so you have this pro European protests, and then you have the nationalist minority in Ukraine, which is very well organized and militant, and extremely suspicious of Yanukovych and Russia's intentions. And police, uh, Ukrainian police tracks down on these protests, pro-European student protests in Kiev, violently and beyond any measure to the actual level of protest activity. And then instead of this leading to the end of protests, the protests grow significantly. Hundreds of thousands of people began protesting almost daily. 
And the critical mass of the protesters was provided by the Kiev's mostly Russophone, but pro-European middle classes. So they provide the numbers, but the determination to fight the police, create camps in downtown Kiev, it comes from organized extreme right nationalists and even neo-Nazi groups. Uh, and the West vehemently supports the protesters. You American and European politicians visit them, they encourage them, incite them, and give them money. Uh, the protesters uh, tear down monuments to Lenin around the country. Uh, there's a march in honor of Stepan Bandera, Ukrainian nationalist World War II leader who collaborated with the Nazis and perpetrated genocide against Jews and Poles. Uh, in parts of Ukraine, mostly, mostly in the West, the protesters seize administrative buildings. They seize weapons from police. Uh, police brutality increases, and eventually there is uh, the protests become extremely violent. In total, 120 protesters and almost 20 police officers were killed. Political agreement to end the street violence mediated by the Western leaders was quickly violated by protesters who were not controlled by anybody really, not by the opposition parties in Ukraine, not by the West. And Yanukovych is forced to flee to Russia to save his life. But since the events of these Euromaidan protests, uh, they become part, central part of Ukrainian identity. I mean, at least in the official narratives pursued by the authorities in Kiev. But they, it's now called the revolution of dignity. It's a pillar of post-Maidan Ukrainian identity. However, at the time, less than half of Ukraine supported the protests. And these divisions were very geographic. So again, less than half of Ukraine actually supported the protests. But this was a revolution by nationalists supported by oligarchs in the West and liberal Ukrainians from Central and Western Ukraine. Uh, the protesters overthrew a democratically elected and legitimate president, however corrupt he was. The subsequent president, Petr Poroshenko, he was also, he was hardly any less corrupt. He was himself an oligarch, he was a young communist leader, but he was pro-Western. He was a chocolate, uh, chocolate king, not chocolate king, he was a chocolate oligarch, having chocolate factories all over the Soviet Union. Uh, one of the first acts of the new government of the new parliament was to revoke a law passed by Yanukovych government, which made the Russian official language, Russian language official in regions where the majority of the population spoke Russian as a native language. So not in the entire Ukraine, but just in the, this thing. Uh, once Yanukovych fell, protests erupted in southern and eastern parts of Ukraine. One of the ways in which you can sense uh, uh, never mind, let's skip this. So there's pro-Russian protests all over parts of the country that tended to vote for Yanukovych. Crimea was autonomous republic in Ukraine, the only region in which Russians make up, an ethnic, Rus ethnic Russians are actually a majority. Uh, Russia had a naval base in Sevast Sevastopol, a city fort in Crimea, so it was really easy for them to sneak in troops. Um, Crimea was part of the Russian Republic in the Soviet Union until Khrushchev himself from Ukraine transferred Crimea from Russia to Ukraine uh, in the post-war period. Crimea occupied a special place in Soviet imagination. It was supposed to be a beautiful Riviera where everybody wanted to vacation and where the country's elites had their dachas, the villas, let's say. Uh, in Russia, the idea that Crimea should be reunited with Russia, and they used reunited in quotations, was very popular among broad sections of society, not just put into politics. So after Yanukovych was ousted, Russian Senate authorized Putin to send army into Ukraine after Biden and uh, popularly known as little green men without an insignia. There are actually Russian special forces from the military intelligence. They surround the Ukrainian bases and effectively seize Crimea from Ukraine. In the referendum, 97% of Crimeans voted to join Russia. And this statistic has been derided a lot in the West as a total fabrication. Nonetheless, there was overwhelming support 
for Ukrainians to join Russia, Russia in the days after Euromaidan revolution and among every ethnic group. So just for one example, in May 2014, Washington DC poster uh, Pew Research published results of a survey that encompassed Crimea, Ukraine, and Russia. And this Western research, a respected research group, showed that 88% of Crimeans believe the government of Kiev should officially recognize the result of Crimea's referendum. While well, other opinion polls put the support for Crimea joining Russia into high 80s or low 90s. After Crimea was seized by Russia in March, well, March and April 2014, there was the so-called Russian Spring all over southeastern Ukraine. It was a Ukrainian separatist movement supported and probably directed from Russia, but uh, it was domestic actors that led this movement. Uh, the pro-Russian protests erupted in all the major cities. Clashes in Odessa in May 2014 between pro and anti Maidan protesters resulted in the burning of 42 pro Russian activists when the building where they were based it was set on fire. The Russian Spring was only successful in Donetsk and Lugansk, the regions in the very east of Ukraine, where protesters managed to take over large parts of these two regions. The regular Russian military did not deploy at this point in Donbass as the regions of Donetsk and Lugansk are known. The self-proclaimed Donetsk and Lugansk, Lugansk People's Republics, known as DNR and LNR, they held a uh, sham referendum, which the Kiev authorities tolerated but did not recognize. And so eventually these two separatist regions in Eastern Ukraine, a war broke out between them and the new Poroshenko government in Kiev. The rebels were supported by weapons and volunteers from Russia. Uh, in July 2014, the Ukrainian rebels, according to various investigations, although rebels denied this, they downed Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, killing almost 300 people. Uh, the Ukrainian military was stronger than the rebel groups at this point, but the regular Russian military would intervene whenever Ukrainians came close to defeating the rebels. So there was two major Russian military interventions beyond Crimea. At the Battle of Ilovoysk in August of 2014 and the Battle of Gebaltsevo in February 2015. The fighting between two sides ended in the so-called Minsk Agreement. These agreements uh, call for restoration of Ukrainian authority throughout Ukraine, including the rebel areas, but it would uh, Ukrainian constitution would be changed to decentralize the country and the rebel regions would be given special status and the soldiers and security services of those rebel regions would then join Ukrainian state. And so all of this gets me to the last section of today's talk, the present day situation. I promise I'll finish relatively well, uh, relatively quickly. Uh, so neither side want, wanted to implement the Minsk Agreement. Uh, there has been low-level fighting since 2015. In total, from the beginning of the war, more than 14,000 people have been killed. Almost all of them are Ukrainian citizens. Uh, Maidan Ukrainians, the Kiev government claims that this is not a civil war, but the Russian military has been involved only occasionally in the fighting. Although the Russian military armed and chained uh, rebels, the fighting done is, is done by Ukrainian citizens. After the new government came to power in Kiev, Ukraine signed European Union and Ukraine Association Agreement. Uh, this agreement is the one that Yanukovych rejected. It doesn't promise EU membership to Ukraine, but the pro-Europeans in Ukraine see this as a first step towards Ukraine joining the European Union. The victory of Maidan uh, and then the seizure of Crimea and the war in Donbass has completely shaken up the Ukrainian political scene. Most parties in media that could have been described as pro-Russian were banned or pressed by the state into this bandy. Soviet symbols have been banned. The ultra-nationalist and even neo-Nazi fighters from Maidan 
the first developed into militias that fought uh, in Donbass. And then from these militias, they have been integrated into Ukrainian armed forces, and some of them now serve in Ukrainian security services, or well, many of them actually serve there. The Russian language is pushed from the public sphere uh, almost completely by this point. Uh, privately, it's used widely, but um, again, from the public sphere, it just, it's just being purged. The opinion purge is a wrong word. It's being replaced by Ukrainian at the insistence of the government. Uh, the opinion in Ukraine has shifted as well as a result of everything that has happened. So I said that prior to the Russian aggression, a minority of Ukrainians supported Ukraine joining NATO. Although that view was entrenched amongst the country's elites, so the elites tended to favor this, but not uh, ordinary Ukrainians. Academics were especially in favor of Ukraine joining NATO, always. But now, after everything that has happened, a slight majority of ordinary Ukrainians supports Ukraine joining NATO. The last figure I saw was that 54% of Ukrainians support uh, NATO. This can be partially explained by the fact that most anti-NATO parts of the country, including Donbass and Crimea, are no longer effectively part of Ukraine, although Ukraine claims that they are. Uh, and partially by the fact that Russia has turned out to uh, be an enemy of Ukraine. Uh, in season Crimea. 72% of Ukrainians now say that Russia is a hostile country, while 12% say that only 12% say that uh, Russia is still an ally of Ukraine. Uh, let me see. So this is these are the pro-Russian protests in Lugansk, and these are the changing attitudes to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, you can see how Ukrainian attitudes were very positive to Russia and how they significantly dropped as a result, as a result of everything that has happened. But despite this, Russia and Ukraine remain close. There's the shared Soviet and post-Soviet culture that unites the people. In some ways, there are millions of Ukrainian laborers in Russia, uh, while hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian citizens settle permanently in Russia. As of 2017, there is an additional almost half a million additional asylum seekers from Ukraine in Russia. Russian dissidents, in contrast, often flee to Ukraine where they do not find it hard to integrate and where they feel safe from the Putinist state. Uh, as a result of Soviet legacy, many Ukrainians and Russians have relatives on the other side of the border. Interestingly, Russia remains Ukraine's main export market, with Ukraine exporting to Russia almost 5 billion worth of goods for almost 10% of its total exports. Russia, meanwhile, exported over $6.5 billion worth, dollar worth of goods to Ukraine, making, making Ukraine Russia's 16th largest trading partner. After Poroshenko, a comedian, and actually a funny comedian, uh, was elected president in 2019. Uh, and he won on a platform of negotiating and ending the war uh, in the east of the country. Zelensky is a Russophone of Jewish background, uh, and he won what's interesting, every, almost every region of Ukraine. So all of the maps have shown you previously how Ukraine tended to go uh, south and east for one candidate and center and west for another candidate. Zelensky won every region except one uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and initially, a lot of supporters of Maidan were outraged when he was elected uh, because he frequently used the Russian language while campaigning. Uh, he used a Russian version of his name before becoming President Vladimir. And then after he became president, he changed it on Twitter and on Facebook to Volodymyr, which would be the Ukrainian version of the same name. And uh, they were also worried that he would actually try to make a deal with Russia and the rebels. Uh, however, uh, once he became president, uh, he didn't really act on these parts of this, this platform. Uh, making a deal with, with the rebels and Russia would entail making painful concessions, and he would risk being either overthrown or losing support, diplomatic and economic support, 
from the West had he actually tried to seriously try, tried to make an agreement with the rebels. And far bigger fear would be nationalist protests in Ukraine. Uh, both Russia and Ukraine, however, they claim that they're committed to Minsk, but they argue how to interpret this peace deal which exists, and which everybody claims is the only way to avoid the war. Uh, and Zelensky then went against his platform soon after becoming president. He arrested Putin's allies in Ukraine. They shut down numerous TV channels and other media. They're even arresting bloggers now. So anybody who could be remotely accused of being uh, not even pro-Russian, but uh, well, they're widely arresting people. Uh, he also wanted to arrest the previous president Poroshenko, but the pressure from European Union uh, for the time being, they've charged Poroshenko with corruption, but they didn't arrest him. Although I think after the situation settles down, they will arrest him. So he's also uh, perhaps building a dictatorship for himself in Ukraine. So, and it brings us to the situation where we are now. The American and British intelligence estimates are that there is 130 to 150,000 Russian soldiers surrounding Ukraine. Uh, the American and British governments say that the war is imminent. They've been saying that for several weeks now. It's one reason why I had to come back early from Kiev, from the archives. Uh, they often play up the worst case scenarios. Full scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Kiev put forward within days, they say, the British intelligence even identified individuals for the appointed leaders of the Russian occupied Ukraine. They release maps, terrifying maps, which way the Russian armies will move through Ukraine. But we haven't seen any evidence to back uh, some of these specific claims. And so undoubtedly, some of them are exaggerated. I mean, some of them are just absurd. Many Europeans, including the Germans and the French, uh, probably do not believe them. Certainly, their intelligence estimates are much more uh, are much more less extreme. The Ukrainian president uh, Zelensky has repeatedly he repeatedly has spoken against the idea that the full scale invasion is being planned. Russian nationalists, those who want Putin to invade uh, Russia uh, to invade <laughs> Ukraine. Uh, they agree that actually there is no preparation for a full-scale war. Um, and if there is a war, the West will impose sanctions on Russia to the third, and it's arming Ukraine, but it will not do anything to actually fight the Russians, because obviously this could lead to a nuclear war. But the fact of the military buildup is true, and Russia has made demands that NATO cannot fulfill. It demanded that NATO not only repudiate, future membership for Ukraine and Georgia, but also to pull back away from Russia to its 1990 borders of NATO, so all the way to Germany. These demands came at the same time as the military buildup around Ukraine. So Russia insisted it will not attack Ukraine, but these two phenomena are clearly linked in the heads of the Russian leaders. NATO expansion, the need to push NATO back, but also the need to repudiate and NATO ambitions in Ukraine and to extend the Russian influence in Ukraine. Uh, so what I'm saying is that even though some of those intelligence reports are clearly exaggerated, uh, there is, the fact is that the Russian military has surrounded, has been placed around Ukraine uh, uh, in an offensive manner. Putin has built up a strong army. Russia has probably never had a stronger, more mobile and more experienced military than it does today. Uh, Russia is less afraid of sanctions than before. Moscow has effectively won support from Beijing. The price of oil is high. Uh, Russian reserves are $620 billion, and Moscow has been preparing for more sanctions since 2014 and making plans how to handle them. Uh, the Western ambition is to isolate Russia in a way that they managed to isolate and bring down Iranian economy after the collapse of the um, nuclear agreement between Iran and the United States. And so Russia has, is taking steps to avoid this from happening. Uh, the longer Russia waits, the stronger Ukraine gets. So these are the reasons why I believe Putin now has decided to resolve these twin issues of Ukraine's orientation and uh, NATO expansion in its neighborhood, let's say. 
However, it's hard to see Russia launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. First, it would be out of character for Putin to launch an open-ended campaign that would infinitely sap Russia's military, financial, and human resources. Military action in Syria, in Crimea, and even Donbass, and, and in Georgia in 2008 had very specific and attainable goals. And, and invasion of Ukraine would not have specific and attainable goals. Second, Ukraine is too big to occupy. Ukraine's population is just under 37 million. Russia's population is around 145 million people. Thus, Russia is almost four times bigger than Ukraine. So try to think how hard it was for the USA to occupy Iraq. The United States was 12 times bigger than Iraq. Russia is only four times bigger than Ukraine. Uh, the differences in the military and economies of Ukraine and Russia are much more than differences between the United States and the entire coalition and Iraq. Uh, Ukrainian cities are huge. Kiev is over 3 million people. Kharkov, which is, would have to be one of the first cities to fall in an offensive to take Ukraine because it's right on the border. It's 1.6 million people. Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporozhye, Odessa, they're all around 1 million people. Any of those places and even much smaller cities such as Mariupol and Donetsk Oblast, it could easily become sites of urban conflict where Russia's technological and military advantages would be minimized. Ukraine doesn't even have to have a strong army for this. They just need several thousand of motivated, chained and armed nationalist volunteers to embed themselves in a city. And it would be extremely hard for Russia to root them out. Russia would need hundreds of thousands of rear security personnel to administer these territories and fight an insurgency. And admittedly, Russia has experiences fighting insurgencies and successful experiences, but with much smaller countries. And the resource is that Russia has not mobilized these rear guard troops yet, at least. Uh, the armies that they have deployed are probably enough to defeat the Ukrainian military in the field quickly, but not to occupy and administer the country. For comparative purposes, the US led coalition sent just under 200,000 soldiers into Iraq to occupy, a country much smaller than Ukraine. Uh, Russia right now has deployed at most 150,000 soldiers around uh, Ukraine. Uh, third, Russians do not support war in Ukraine. Russians are not emotionally attached to Donetsk and Lugansk. Nobody cares in Russia who controls Mariupol. Uh, Crimea mattered. Crimea resonated emotionally and politically, however you want to put it, with broad sectors of Russian society. Even Russian liberals kind of welcomed this uh, attack on Crimea. Uh, and as a result, Putin got a boost, which lasted for years, his popularity went through the roof. Uh, if Putin wins a war, if Russia defeats Ukraine in the field, I'm sure they would eventually prevail. Nothing like, there wouldn't be a political benefit to this for Russian leadership. If anything, a large number of Russians arriving in body bags would actually cause a serious political problem for the Russian government. So these are some reasons why I do not believe this full-scale invasion is likely to take place. However, there are people who strongly disagree with me and some of these people are very reasonable and they know a lot about Russian military. So this is my view though. Um, so the contrary view to what I've suggested about the Russian aim is being more limited. Uh, for, so my argument is obviously that the uh, invasion will likely be more limited, but Michael Hoffman is a specialist on modern Russian military. He's been arguing something very different. So I encourage you to read his articles, Michael Hoffman on the internet about this. And he has a lot on Twitter. For all of these reasons, if there is a renewed war, I think, and it's a big if, it's much more likely that it will be a local war in this part of Ukraine, Donbass, where it's, there's already fighting. The likely scenario would be as follows. There is renewed fighting in Donbass. Then the Russian parliament recognizes the rebel states as independent countries. And then Putin demands the withdrawal of Ukrainian forces from the entirety of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Right now, 
in Ukraine controls probably half or even more in terms of geography of these two regions, but although they don't control the main cities. Ukraine, of course, would not fulfill this ultimatum, and then Russia would launch an attack. Uh, the war would be officially over Donetsk and Lugansk regions, but it could take in wider places in Ukraine. In the process, Russia would definitely try to fundamentally degrade Ukraine's military capabilities. Uh, we came with setting them back uh, to 2014. And potentially the Russian goals could change as the fighting would go on or as Putin's ambitions would expand. Possibly Russians could link Crimea to Donetsk Oblast to provide Crimea with fresh water supplies. So this is a scenario for a smaller war, but it will still be devastating. Thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians would be killed, while there would be tens of thousands of refugees. So this would be an absolute catastrophe and the biggest war uh, that Europe has ever seen since, or probably bigger than the wars in former Yugoslavia. Um, I have a thing on what I think how, how What could be done to try and avoid the fighting? But maybe this is something that we could talk about in the later sections. Uh, I talked for more than 45 minutes, but yeah. Well, thank you so much, Voyan, for that uh, presentation of the complexities of, of Ukrainian internal realities, as well as the multiple levels of motivation for the uh, for Russian interest in Ukraine. I think that's, again, my goal tonight was to try, is to try to bring a view of those complexities to non-specialist American audiences, right? We have many people on this call who have specialized knowledge and, and uh, experience in the regions that you're describing, but many of the people who will watch the recording especially are not going to be specialists. And so, being exposed to these complexities and your perspective on, on them is so valuable. Um, so I wonder in the time that we have left, I'm happy with this group to open it to general conversation. And uh, for those of you who uh, are on the call, uh, we have 17 of us here. I think that the group is small enough for you to just unmute yourself and, and offer uh, a question or a comment at this time. I was hearing Voyan also welcoming any disagreement with his analysis, <laughs> if you happen to have it. Um, and so I, I think that that would be valuable as well. So friends, uh, jump in and offer your perspective. Uh, I see Professor Olga has has uh, unmuted herself. Could you please introduce yourself and uh, and offer what you would like to say? Yeah. Uh, good evening to everybody. I'm professor here at University of North Texas, and uh, I teach Russian history. And uh, I'm very much interested in uh, the events in Ukraine. Follow the news. Uh, my question to uh, Voyen, just to be sure that I got your message right. Um, what I have heard uh, that um, Western intention is to isolate Russia. So then you also used extensively the uh, very Russian term expansion of NATO. So does it mean that you see that Putin's aggr aggressive movements now is are reactive to Western politics directed to is isolating Russia and expanding, I hate this, but I personally hate this term expansion of NATO because NATO didn't expand. It was invited by the peoples in the area, Eastern Europe. NATO was invited and um, uh, we know why. So does it mean that Putin's uh, aggressive politics you see as reactive 
to this Western politics. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't think it's reactive. I think I, I've tried to argue that Putin has, the Russian leadership has two intentions. One is to keep Ukraine in its orbit. And it's not enough for Ukraine not to join NATO. Um, it's about more than this. This idea that the Russians, Ukrainians, the Russians are one people. Uh, Ukraine declaring neutrality is not, wouldn't resolve Russian Kremlin's animosity and aggression against Ukraine. So I don't think it's only reactive. Uh, I'm not sure that in case of Ukraine, when uh, Ukraine was offered a roadmap for NATO to join uh, NATO in 2008. Uh, vast majority of Ukrainians were against joining NATO. Ukrainian leaders were in favor of joining. But every opinion poll put it like 25 to 20 to 30%, let's say. Uh, but that offer was made um, in 2008. That has changed now, and majority of Ukrainians don't want to join NATO. Uh, considerable majority. Uh, so I think that uh, Russian policies are not only reactive, they also originate from the place of Russia wanting to control its neighborhood. I think it's easiest for Putin to talk about uh, NATO because that's something that's most understandable and perhaps most legitimate to say, I really don't wanna have a military alliance that serves, uh, which was created against Russia uh, on my doorstep. That sounds legitimate, more legitimate than let's unite like Ukrainians and Russians. So they talk about this, but I think they have two goals. Thank you for that question and, and, and response. Others, I invite your contribution to the conversation. I did have a question. Please, and please introduce yourself. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Adam Warren, and I'm a uh, senior at uh, UNT, previously International um, Studies major, now Integrative Studies, but it's kind of beside the point. Um, so to my knowledge, given the French and, and German kind of general lack of support for current Ukrainian admission to NATO, which to my knowledge would require uh, in order for a member state to join NATO, it requires the unanimous consent of present member states, as well as a few other points of, um, a few other requirements, including stuff like a uh, lack of contested borders and things like that. The threat of Ukrainian admission to NATO doesn't seem to be all that legitimate. So to what extent would kind of the Russian attempt at maintaining the kind of Russo sphere or kind of maintaining Russian or securing Russian polarity to what degree would that in your mind be of more significance in the actual NATO conflict itself? I, I hope I made myself clear there. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think I, you're asking me if I think that since Ukraine is not likely to join NATO anytime soon anyway, if uh, Kremlin is more driven by this idea of trying to keep Ukraine in its sphere of influence for nationalist purposes and not only security reasons. Correct. Okay. I, I think it's perhaps, I, I think both of these drive Russian policy towards uh, Ukraine and NATO. Uh, but I also think that the, uh, the Kremlin views uh, unilateral, not unilateral, but like cooperation between Ukraine and individual NATO states also as a threat. So anything that can tip the balance significantly, I mean, at the end of the day, Ukraine, Ukrainians and Russians are not that different. Whatever the Russian military is capable of building, with time, Ukrainians will build it as well. It's a, we're similar countries with similar economic base and 
history. So uh, I think that they're afraid that Ukraine could achieve something like military parity, not parity, but something that would make Russian incursions so costly to them, not only by joining NATO, but also by cooperating with individual NATO countries. And of course, the irony is that every Russian attempt to every Russian attempt to coerce Ukraine only leads to more cooperation between Ukraine and NATO countries. So, for example, since the recent deployment of NATO of Russian forces around Ukraine, uh, Ukraine has probably received more weapons in the past two months than it did in the previous two years. I'm not sure how much of those weapons would actually tip the balance in a meaningful way, uh, but uh, that would be an example of that, yeah. Thank you. I really hate to put people on the spot, but I think I will. Uh, Veronica Suter is uh, a colleague and friend of mine. She sits on the board of Briarwood Leadership Center. And uh, Veronica, as someone from hun Hungary, I'm wondering how you view these developments. I just um, extremely appreciate uh, your refreshing view uh, on uh, on actually uh, kind of just to describe Putin's uh, assumed intentions. Uh, since uh, I I just know I, I grew up in Hungary um, just right after um, the socialism uh, was over and. Uh, since, since I, I remember, I remember Putin being uh, in leadership position and uh, the, these conversations, what just like happened to be on the news, these were like happening every January, February. This was just like always um, a conversation about, you know, Put, Putin likes to do these mind games, I feel. Uh, and it, it was just really refreshing to, to hear some, I heard something like that uh, you were saying, maybe, maybe it was not your intention. Well, I heard that. Um, so <laughs> I'm just glad to be part of this conversation. Uh, and at the same time, I uh, see a question on the side from uh, Boris, who has uh, his microphone not working. So... Uh, I will read out uh, the the question. Do you think Nord Stream 2 has much to do with the current situation? Uh, so, well, speaking of Hungary, I mean, so we are Hungarian the leaders in Russia have pretty good relations right now. And I've known Ukrainians have been complaining that Hungary has agreed uh, has received discounted gas. Um, so, sorry, but the question about Nord Stream 2, I don't think, well, if what the Western and Br um, American and British intelligence agents are saying, intelligence agencies are saying is true that, that uh, Russia will take over all of Ukraine, then who cares about Nord Stream 2 because they'll control direct pipelines leading to, uh, leading to, Central Europe, uh, uh, Nord Stream, not who will care, but obviously Nord Stream 2 loses in significance. Uh, but I think that Nord Stream 2 matters to Americans, it seems to me. Um, I mean, it's not, I don't follow American politics frequently, but I know that in American Senate, there have been several attempts uh, to sanction Russia for uh, Germany for cooperating with and uh, to sanction economic organizations and institutions that work with Nord Stream 2. Uh, there's fear that in DC that Nord Stream 2 would significantly increase uh, Germany's dependence on Russian gas. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate that is. Uh, there's no alternative to Russian natural gas in Europe for the foreseeable future. So, um, and Nord Stream 2 is complete. Uh, 
is still waiting for approval for gas to go through these pipes to reach Germany. But I think that eventually, well, the most recent news is that neither SWIFT, uh, this economic, this banking tool which allows transfer of money and which uh, enables all international payments to take place, but neither the SWIFT nor Nord Stream 2 is on tables for uh, sanctions, at least immediately in case of an escalation of Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, so that's that would be my answer to this question. And you'll see that Veronica also noted that Hungary's particular gas deal with Russia. <laughs> um, Andrew, would you you can go ahead and unmute if you would like to uh, speak, if you're able. Um, certainly. Uh, my question is, I wrote down there, is uh, let me just, in regards to a claim I've heard recently about uh, far-right fighters um, uh, with working and cooperating with the Ukrainian military, uh, and some uh, critics, especially of Western support for Ukraine, citing that we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine because Ukraine permits these far right fighters to um, be there and to work in this region. And I know this is, there's a history of this as well, but just want to ask uh, Dr. Mestrovic about what his thoughts about this. Is this actually a problem? Or is this not related to Ukrainian politics and just some side issue? What are your thoughts or views? Um, it's a tough question. I, I think it matters. Uh, on the one hand, the far right uh, they never win electorally. They don't do well in Ukraine. Ukraine is not as a whole a far extremist country, far from it. And they repeatedly get, they lose elections. Uh, however, those much smaller militia type groups uh, have been integrated. Uh, they're very effective. They can mobilize easily. And in case of any internal Ukrainian conflict, as we've seen during Euromaidan in 2014, uh, they play an outsized role, far more consequential role than their numbers would suggest. They're organized, they have military training, uh, and that was the case even before militarization that took place as a result of the war with Russia. Uh, now they've been integrated into official Ukrainian state structures. On the one hand, that um, gives them, uh, they're supposedly under control to an extent of Ukrainian state. On the other hand, uh, they also get to control the state to an extent. Uh, some of those groups like Azov, they've been accused of committing war crimes. They're part of the extreme right-wing international Nazi scene, let's say the Nazi scene. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it discredits all of Ukraine. It doesn't even discredit Ukrainian armed forces uh, that they have this far right element. It, it discredits them to an extent, but not such a level as Russian propaganda would claim. Uh, I think most countries, many countries have problems with the far right. Most countries' militaries, I mean, have problems with the far right. Uh, not just, uh, that's not just the case in Ukraine. So uh, that would be my answer. Well, as we come to the close of our scheduled time, uh, Voyan, I, I wonder if you'd be willing to, for those of us who don't read Russian or, or even Cyrillic, uh, if you could just translate the poster that is to your left over your shoulder uh, that some some would notice and be able to read, uh, but others can't. Well, it's upside down. I have a, a Soviet propaganda poster. I'm not sure if you can see it. Uh, it's a Soviet propaganda poster. It says, Slava Osimovitinen. Glory to liberators of Ukraine, death to German conquerors. And there's a Soviet soldier being embraced by a Ukrainian 
since the present woman under the Bogdan Khmelnytsky monument I mentioned earlier. This is, I swear, a coincidence. I just have Soviet propaganda posters. I teach World War II. I had no idea I got this poster three years ago. I had no idea that it would fit so well in today's uh, talk. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Who has, uh, who has contributed to these conversations this evening. I see, uh, I see some good chat going on, so capture that uh, before, the, before this uh, time together ends. But uh, Professor Maestrovich, thank you so much uh, for your contribution to deepening our understanding, deepening our comprehension of this current conflict uh, through, through, your, uh, through your perspective and Thanks to each of you for, for offering your questions, your, your perspective on this, com this complex matter. And hopefully those who view this recording will be able to comprehend more deeply uh, this, this conflict and its complexities. Thanks again to everyone. Good night, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, and thanks for organizing this. Absolutely. Bye. Bye, -bye Thank you, all. Professor. Bye. Thank you very much for both of you. Very in time. Thank you. Very useful. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the insight. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yes. And the recording will be posted soon. <laughs>